The world has little interest in the doctrines that Christians believe, but it takes notice when believers love one another. As someone has said, our lives are the books that people read every day, and those outside the church are drawn to experience the love that we as believers share. Today, a look at why we do what we do, and what our underlying motive must be if we're to reach the lost. Stay with us. From Chicago's Moody Church, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. We're in a series on Finding Where You Fit. Turn with us to the book of 1 Corinthians as Dr. Lutzer comes now to tell us about the motivation of love. So let me begin with a question. What is it that really does distinguish us as a church from the world? Is it because we have more money than the world? Well, you can laugh at that because obviously the answer is no. Let me ask you, is it because we are more committed to our cause than the world is to its causes? Unfortunately, the answer to that, again, may be no. There are some people who are more committed to save the whales than we are committed to save souls. Is it because of what we believe? Is that what makes us different? Well, that's a trick question now, so be very careful before you answer it, because in one sense the answer is yes, of course it's what we believe that makes us different. But what we believe in and of itself does not give us a visible difference from the world. If you're going to speak about visible difference, you have to go back to the words of Jesus Christ. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one toward another. Now, I need to tell you that throughout the years, I've always felt a little uneasy about that verse. I haven't minded quoting it, of course, because it comes from the lips of Christ himself. But I feel uneasy because I have seen in church history so many churches that have emphasized love that they have compromised truth. And there's always that temptation, isn't there? The temptation is that love can just swallow truth whole. And and we've seen that time and time again when there are those who will begin to renege on the doctrines because they say, well, you know, God is love. And from there, all kinds of heresies have flowed. The tension between love and truth is always there. It's been there since the church began, really. The year is just uh, 200. Just the third century, northern Africa, extreme persecution breaks out. Violent uh, persecution against the Christians. And you know what happens is, understandably, there are some Christians who uh, denied Christ under pressure. Then the persecution ended, and the question was, should we welcome these folks back into the church or shouldn't we? The church was divided. Cyprian wrote a letter, and uh, he was a bishop in the church, and he argued that, of course, we should invite them back. If they repent, they should be welcome, because, after all, the founder of the church, the supposed founder, Peter himself, denied Christ under pressure. So why can't we welcome these people back? There was another man in the church by the name of Novation, and he argued differently. Uh, Novation said that uh, if we begin to welcome these people back, number one, we will depreciate the value of martyrdom, and number two, what an example for future generations. Young people are going to say, well, you can deny Christ under pressure because all that you need to do is repent, and you're reinstated into the church. It's no big deal. So Novation became a hardliner. In fact, he said that we should not even serve communion to someone who has been married twice. So you have a split in the church. You have the love church on the one side, and then on the other side you have the the truth church. And uh, historians tell us that when that split occurred, the church began to then have so many internal divisions among itself that soon it forgot its mission to the world because it had to clean up its own act and resolve the problem of a split. But in the Bible, truth and love go hand in hand. And today, the topic is love. And the chapter is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we would misinterpret this passage were it not for the need to put it into context. 
In chapter 12, and you remember I preached two messages on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then we went to Romans chapter 12, and then now we're back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the last part of the chapter, and then chapter 13. Paul has been discussing the issue of gifts with people who have been absorbed with the the various gifts, particularly those sensational gifts. And Paul commends them and says, I commend you because you come behind in no spiritual gift. There were people who were seeking gifts like the gift of tongues and miracles, and they they were taking these uh, to an extreme. And so Paul ends the 12th chapter and says, uh, he lists them in verse 28, God is appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, and then he puts tongues last. And he says, not all are apostles, are they? Not all are prophets, not all speak in tongues, etc. He says, all do not have the gifts of healing. Verse 31, earnestly desire the greater gifts. Now, he is not telling us that we should go through the list of gifts and choose the ones that we want. He's already emphasized that it is God who puts these gifts within the body and distributes them as he wills. But Paul is saying that as a church, when you are thinking about gifts, don't just concentrate on the supernatural gifts, but rather, he says, concentrate on the more important gifts, the greater gifts of communication, of teaching, and of evangelism. And then he says, but I have a more excellent way to teach you. Because no matter how gifted you are, if you don't know this, you have missed it. And you've missed it by at least a mile. And that's the context now of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, since this is a famous chapter and it's a chapter on love, I'd like to take you by the hand and very lovingly, let's walk through this passage of Scripture together. And then what we're going to do is to look at it and and see its implications for us, for our lives, and for the church. First of all, in verses 1 to 3, Paul says, Love is necessary. Love is necessary. He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, if I am that gifted and do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Wouldn't you like to have the gift of tongues? Some people would. Some of 